right. A good evening to you all and a warm welcome to our Friday night talk show. So this is a very special meeting that we are having. And joining me today are Sarah and Marco Spinola. And we are going to be talking about their journey. So John Banyan once said, what God says is best is best, though all men in the world are against it. So we want to see the journey that Marco and Sarah have embarked on and are still on, actually. And what better way to start but right at the beginning. So Marco, Sarah, who are Marco and Sarah Spinola? Maybe I can start with you, Marco. All right. Well, first of all, Neri, thank you for having us tonight. And just want to welcome all the young people. It's so nice to be with you. And uh, we trust the Lord for a good time. So my name's Marco Spinola, for those who don't know me. I grew up in Zimbabwe. Uh, soon after I finished school, I left the country to go abroad and was there for many years and have recently come back to Zimbabwe. And uh, we're happy here. This is my lovely wife on my left. And we've been married now, I think, eight, going on eight years. So that's who we are, in a nutshell. <laughs> okay, so... Evening, everyone, and welcome. We're so, so grateful to be here. Um, my name is Sarah Spinola. I am 30 years old, and I'm a doctor by profession, born and raised in beautiful Bulawayo. And um, yeah, we also lived overseas for several years, but we've now been back in, in Bulawayo three years, and we're just, we're just so, so blessed to be here. So thank you for having us. Thank you very much, Sarah, Marco. <laughs> So, of course, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the grace of the Lord. So maybe we can start there, Marco. Can you tell us how and hmm. when did you get saved? Okay, yeah. So I got saved at a tender age, at 13 years old. And uh, already at that time, I had such a, a conviction of sin and just an awareness of what happens after death. And if I'd been 13 and had reached that stage where... I had already done things that I wasn't proud of, what would I be able to answer to the Lord if he really existed? And so I was searching. I was so empty inside. I was so lost, and I was just looking for some kind of meaning in life. And uh, we moved from Utari to Bulawayo, and at that time I gave up looking for the Lord. I read my Bible every night. I understood nothing. And I was invited to go to a youth camp in Shalom, in Matopas. And uh, I didn't know it was a Christian camp. I just remember the first day I was in a team. I played my heart out. I had a lot of fun, had a shower, and then a gong went. And I realized, hang on, what is going on? And I realized this is a Christian camp. And at the first meeting, I felt the love of God just knocking on my heart. And I responded, and uh, that's how I got born again. Beautiful. And of course, salvation stories are never identical. Sarah, care to tell us your story? Yeah, so mine is quite different. Um, I came from a Christian background, so my mom was actually a children's church teacher. So from a very young age, you know, she'd speak to us about the Lord. I can distinctly remember from three years old, us having little devotions as a family. And so when I was eight, um, I made the decision to follow Jesus. And you might say eight is so young, but I had understood that Jesus had died on the cross for me, and I'd understood that he had a plan for my life. And so from very young, I knew that God had a plan. He'd set me apart. There was something specific he wanted me to do. However, I didn't understand the cost of being a disciple until I was about 13 or 14. And that's when it was like, oh, wow, it's not just Christian by name, but there's a cost that comes with that. Mm. And do you remember what brought about that awakening? Like at 13, do you have any recollection of what made you actually realize that this is it? Well, um, I had moved to a Christian school when I was about 15. And um, when I got there, I thought, oh, great, this is a Christian school. You know, we're going to do devotions every morning. It's going to be so easy to serve the Lord. But in fact, it was difficult um, because we all know that word compromise. It's so easy to have one foot in the church, one foot in the world. And that's where I found myself. Um, and yet I was so unhappy because somewhere I realized that I wasn't fully in one camp or the other camp. Yes. And as a result of that, I was torn. I remember distinctly um, one of my friends at school had a party and it was at a club. And I got there and I, I was 17 and I realized, oh my gosh, what am I actually doing here? And I knew 
you know, they were hearing the same things I was hearing because they were also at a Christian school. But I thought, why are they able to dance to the music and have fun? And I am not enjoying myself. And I remember the Lord just so clearly speaking to me and saying, it's because you're saved. It's because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And my desires were different. I couldn't live that life. Mm. It just, it didn't fit. And um, that was when I, I made the decision that, you know what, I'm going to stop doing this double life thing because it doesn't help anyone. Um, but I can say at the age of 17, that's when I said, I'm, I'm all in Jesus. Absolutely. Sounds transformational. Amen. Yeah. And we know that being saved is not always cupcakes, sprinkles, and rainbows. Uh, Marco, tell us, what are some of those challenges that you faced after having received the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior? Uh, or was it all smooth sailing? No, 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 not at all. <laughs> and there are still challenges. And uh, there will always be challenges in our walk with the Lord. Um, but I think two that stuck out to me that I really battled with in my early days uh, as a Christian was I struggled a lot with condemnation. And I found it so difficult to accept and to receive the unconditional love of God that he could just love me as I am, even when I missed it or made a mistake. I used to beat myself up so much. And if only I just knew how much the Lord loved us and that he was willing to forgive us at any moment if we were just ready to repent. And so that was a big battle for me for many years. And I thank God that uh, not that is not there, but um, I understand a bit more of the grace of God. I think the second most difficult thing I struggled with is that I wanted my family to be saved, and they weren't. And so it was not easy living a Christian life in a non-Christian home. And I was just thinking this afternoon, and I remember we were robbed uh, when I was 17 years old, and uh, we had some thieves. They were, my brother had just come vis to visit us from overseas. We ate dinner, and we just sat down for a cup of tea. And in walked four thieves, armed with guns, uh, tied us up with all the cables in the house, put a blanket over our head. And I just remember thinking, this is the day that I die. Mm -hmm. And yet I was so at peace. I was so, I just said, Lord, make it quick if it comes. But my biggest fear yeah. was that my family wasn't saved. And there was a turmoil in me. And I just said, Lord, please just spare my family. And uh, my mom called me this morning. I didn't know we were uh, going to be on, uh, on live stream. And she just said, are oh, you sharing, you're doing an interview tonight? And I said, how do you know that, mom? And she said, no, I saw the link. And I'm just so grateful that my brother today, he's serving the Lord. He loves Jesus. He's a wonderful family man with two kids, wonderful husband to his wife. And that my mom is open to the Lord. And I'm very grateful for that. Wow, well, um, shout out to Marcus, mom, if she's watching. <laughs> Great. Um, awesome. I think for me it's a little bit different, if I can say. As I said, I was in a Christian home, and um, the biggest challenge, I would say, for me was compromise, as I'd mentioned earlier, but realizing that just because I was around people who called themselves Christian, if they weren't willing to take that narrow road, then I somehow had to distance myself from them. Mm -hmm. And that was very hard, because there were people that I loved dearly, um, people that... I had known for, for many years, mm -hmm. and I'm really grateful because now years later, it's like I've come full circle, and a lot of those people have now given their lives to the Lord, fully engaged um, in the life of the church, and, and our relationship has been restored. But if at that time I had continued to follow them on the broad road, as they call it, I can tell you my life would have been very different. Um, and making that step and that stand is honestly a big part of my salvation. Yes, and I'm sure it wasn't easy to actually take that big step, was it? Yeah. yeah. And we know that it says that whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone, and behold, the new has come. So maybe, Marco, can you tell us um, what happened there? <laughs> I don't know what happened, <laughs> but I know I was a new man. Yes. And it took, took a few days to realize what had actually happened in my heart, because I'd responded to the Lord that first night at camp. And I just remember being at the altar and I couldn't control, just bawling my eyes out. Just mm -hmm. cried and cried and cried. 
I just felt so loved by the Lord. And I went to bed that night, and the next day I had fun. But on the third day of camp, someone did something to irritate me. And I swore at them. I said, I'm going to beat you. And the moment those words came out my mouth, I just felt so dirty inside. I just felt like I needed to go run and take a shower from the inside. And I couldn't explain it. And it was the first time I realized something had changed. Something was different. And it started a journey with the Lord where it's not about rules and, re and regulations where you can do that, you can't do that. But as I walked with the Lord, He started to show me. Yes. And He started to put an un uh, un uncomfortableness with sin. Mm -hmm. And my friends changed. My desires changed. Everything changed. So, yeah, that was maybe one of the things I can highlight on. Yes. Um, and Sarah, do you have a similar story in actually realizing that there was actually a change that had taken place within your heart? Well, I think growing up, growing up in a Christian background, um, I wanted to be the good girl. And I think people here who've grown up in Christian backgrounds can relate to that. Um, whether you're a pastor's kid or not, you can feel that pressure to want to be perfect, want to do things the right way. But I very soon realized I can't be perfect, and I'm going to make mistakes, and I'm going to fall. And that was very hard. But every time I knew that when I fall, when I made a mistake, I could run into the arms of Jesus yes. because repentance is our greatest gift and come to the Lord with my whole heart and ask him to help me and ask him to forgive me and stand back on my feet and keep running, you know, and not be discouraged in those times. Because I think it's very easy as Christians when we struggle or we, we have a weakness that we condemn ourselves, but we also just sort of sit on the lay-by and say, oh, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe there's someone who can do this better. But yet Jesus has called you and he has a specific plan. And it's so precious to embrace that and be a part of his plan. Amen. Sounds absolutely transformational. And on that special note, we are going to turn to you, the audience. It is a live audience after all. So does anybody have a question? Maybe you may be listening to us and saying, what is happening? What does this even mean? Um, we are just going to take a couple of minutes uh, to engage you. Hi, everyone. So I've got a question for Marco. You said you got saved, but your parents and your family were not saved at that time. And I'd assume your friends were not either. So how was the transformation from camp? We are now a new creation, but you are back to the same people who were not saved. How was the life after that, and how did you cope? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I always say that when the Lord saves us, he doesn't take us out of the world to spare us from troubles, but he wants to take the world out of us. And when he takes the world out of us, it makes us different. And sometimes that creates opposition. Sometimes it creates rejection, persecution. And I remember the first hour I got off that bus at camp, I was yeah. met by a wave of resistance, of persecution, and my whole world came tumbling down. I'd been three days, four days in almost a, a paradise for me. And, and uh, that was during the holiday period. And then my first day at school, I said, I'm going to tell everyone that I'm a Christian. And I thought all my friends would be excited. And I think I literally lost every single friend in the space of one morning. And I used to sit by myself under a tree, read my Bible uh, for a long time until one of my best friends got saved, and uh, that was a big support to me, but um, I think the word, the word of God is clear that anyone who wants to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Mm -hmm. It's the road our Lord walked, it's the road we are called to walk, and we are called to love those who persecute us, and not to hate them and retaliate. So I think the best thing is just to cling to God's word and allow that to instruct us in whatever we face in life. I hope that answers your question. All right. 
great. She's got another hand yeah. right there. There's another one there as well. Um, my question is for Sarah. Um, you spoke about um, how you realized that you didn't want to compromise and that you had to separate yourself from from friends. Um, I just want to know, like, what what helped you? What did you have people to help you through that stage? Is are there people that you gravitated to that had a similar conviction? Like, what hel helped you? Because I feel like nowadays, as young people. As a Christian, you are, you are in that place, but it's not easy because you still have, you love your friends, like you said. Mm. What, what helped you? Um, thank you, Mel. I think relationships were probably a very vital key um, to helping me in those, in those times because it is a lonely road. But I wasn't at a place, I was at a place also where I was willing to, if it meant not have any friends and sit with the teachers at break time, I was willing to do that. And some of you might think, oh gosh, that's, that's extreme. <laughs> but at that time, I was willing to do that. Um, and it wasn't for very long. I think it was probably about three months where that happened. And then eventually, there were several other boys and girls in my school who, who also got saved and radically and who decided to make a stand for the Lord. Um, but I also discovered my Bible in a beautiful way. And I really memorized scripture, um, verses that still encourage me today from that time. And um, a book that was very dear to me was the book of Proverbs. And, you know, when you read that book, you realize that Solomon went through many, many things. But at the end of the day, what spoke greatly to him was God's word and clinging to the Lord. And Jesus had to become my everything. And I'm glad that I realized that early because when I went to medical school, I was in a foreign country, new language, new culture, completely different. Isolated from my family, isolated from, from people I knew. Um, I'm so grateful for the church family that was there, but oftentimes I, I was alone, and oftentimes I had to even be away from the church family and not attend meetings because I had to study, and it was difficult. It was very hard, um, but I'm grateful that I stayed on the road, and I can tell you that came at a price, um, but I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't taken that stand. I hope that answers you. All right. Thank you very much for all the questions. Uh, we're just going to move on, and I'm just going to jump onto what Sarah was saying there earlier on. She spoke about relationships, and this is a term that we hear a lot. Um, we ought to have relationships. We ought to build relationships. But what does that term really mean, Sarah? What is it to have relationships or to build relationships? Okay, so by definition, the word relationship is just a connection between two people. Essentially, that, that's what it is. Um, now, I think in church language, it's easy to say, like she said, you know, we must build relationships, we must seek after those relationships. Um, but how does that come about? For me, it came about through serving. And I was at, at a place where I was ready to, if I had to go clean a certain elder's house or help him move or whatever it, it was at that particular time where there was a need, I was willing to do that. And that opened a door for me to get to know certain brothers and sisters who were also there. And why, why were they there? Because they wanted to serve, because they wanted to grow. And it's important to surround yourself with people who have the same, not idea, but the same vision as what you have. Because there are many people in the church who are quite happy to just be Sunday Christians. And what do I mean by that? Come to church on a Sunday, they come halfway through the service, they leave before the meeting ends, and they've done their service to the Lord for that week, and that's it. There's nothing more. Monday to Saturday, they live their own life. But in order to be somebody who's a son and a daughter, somebody who can be counted on, somebody that can be trusted, that comes through relationship, and that's biblical. If you look at the New Testament, Paul often talks about Timothy and Titus, these young men who served the Lord with him, who were willing to go on the mission field with him. And I don't think it was easy for these men, but they paid a price. And the reality is, it's as Marco said earlier, you know, we can't expect to enter into what the Lord has with us for us without denying ourselves. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. 
sounds like it takes like a lot of tenacity to step into mm. that. And maybe to those who are listening, they may say, oh, but Sarah, you just sound naturally bold and confident. Um, is it that, is anyone able to do so? Like build relationships, form relationships? Maybe Marco can help us mm. in answering that yeah. question. So, yeah, I think um, w what I want to say, first of all, is that relationship is one of the most important things in our walk with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And we need relationship if we want to make it to the end of the road. And it starts off with a relationship with the Lord. If we do not preserve, if we do not guard, if we do not feed our relationship with the Lord, our relationship with others will always be shaky, always be reserved, we will have reservations, uh, because relationships in the church are spiritual, and we can't force them. We can't force relationship. The Lord in His wisdom, He knits our hearts with those that He wants us to walk with. Yes. I know I've wanted relationships sometimes with people for years, and it didn't come. It just felt like I was forcing, felt like I was trying, and the more I tried, the more disappointed and frustrated. But we need to be at peace where we're not forcing relationships. So we take the pressure off. Yes. But as we walk with the Lord and we strengthen our relationship with Him, He brings people on our path. Uh, the other thing is that it's not because we have the same interests. It's not because we are the same age. When I was in my early 20s, most of my time I spent with people in their late 30s because I just wanted to learn to grow for them. The guys my age, let them do what they want to do. But I was seeking for something. And, uh, you know, it made me so vulnerable yes. because who we are is exposed. Mm. And uh, like you were asking, my wife is a very outgoing personality. I'm very, I'm extremely shy. I, my social skills, I think I was at the back of the line. But these things can't be an excuse to stop us Absolutely. because the Lord made me that way. And in the beginning of my walk with the Lord, I was very insecure. Mm -hmm. I couldn't start a conversation like everyone else could start. I couldn't hold that conversation like everyone else could. But the Lord did a work in me where I became secure in my timidity, in my shyness, my reserve. But, but I'm not trying. It's not going to be a stumbling block. I know what I need to do. I'm some, at times, I need to step out of my comfort. But I'm not putting a pressure on myself to be like outgoing and bubbly and all that, but that's how God made me, that's how God made others. Mm -hmm. And we must just be at peace, not force relationships, but as we serve the Lord, He will bring people on our road to help us. Absolutely. So what I'm hearing is that in spite of what we may deem to be our personality traits, there is still something there, something from the Lord, of the Lord, that mm. we can actually... Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. You know, awesome. my wife's a medical doctor, and she'll tell you in the body, the fingers are for one purpose, the nose is for another purpose, the, the liver, mm -hmm. and we're all so different, but each has its place in the body of Christ, and we're linked, and our bond together is in the love of Christ. And I think and just to add on that, you know, as Marco shared about the body, each body has its function, but if we look around us, each person has their own gifts and their own talents. Yes. And how beautiful is it when we embrace the talents that God has given us for his kingdom. I can tell you when I was studying, I needed to be diligent to be able to memorize and learn all and pass all those exams. But that's something that God had already given me because he knew that I would need it for my road. And so often, you know, the biggest thing is we fall into the trap of trying to photocopy someone else's road. You know, they've done it this way, they did this, they went there, so I need to. But it's really not like that. It comes down to being obedient to what the Lord has asked you to do yeah. and grow where you're planted. Yeah. Not all of us are going to have the same opportunities. Not all of us are going to have the same challenges. Not all of us are going to be born in a Christian family. But the reality is when we get to heaven, the Lord is going to ask of us, what did you do with what I gave you? Yeah. And that's a big challenge because I believe, you know, with what we hear, the Lord is going to hold us more accountable than other people. And that's almost a scary thought because you can think, whoa, you know, but that's a wonderful thing. How wonderful that God has entrusted us and entrusted you to be seated where you're sitting tonight and to hear what you're hearing. Yeah. 
Can I just add to that? Absolutely. I think also when we are secure in the way the Lord has made us, mm -hmm. but we're also vulnerable and we are open, it removes all, we stop competing. Yes. I remember when I was young, I used to think, ah, but that guy is close to that guy. I also want to be close to that guy. Mm -hmm. And what do I need to do? And it just, it seems so unfair. Mm -hmm. But the Lord knows who I need in my life. And Absolutely. He knows who He will bring. And when we're, insecure with, when we're secure with that, but we're open to whatever the, the Lord will naturally, things will happen naturally. And we mustn't complicate Christian life. Honestly, guys, Christian life is simple. And the simpler we can be, the better it will be. Wow. Well, just yeah. to jump on that metaphor, uh, the one that you spoke about with, each individual having a place in the body or, yes. So how do you find that place? Um, is it as natural as where your finger is located or where your pinky is? Uh, how exactly does one person who is looking for their place within the church, how do they find it? And what are some of the difficulties that can be associated with finding this place? Um, I think there's a lot to do with our own character. And, you know, as Marco said, he naturally is shy. So um, it's true God made him that way, but also there's still a challenge that the Lord will bring, yes. you know, and we are all required somewhere to step out of the boat like Peter did because that's our call as a Christian. And it's easy to make excuses and say, oh, but I'm not there or oh, this and oh, that. But the reality is it's going to cost us something. Yes. And very often I realize that when I shy away and I choose to take a back seat, Sometimes, yes, it can be my personality, my insecurity, but sometimes it's also my pride mm. because I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want people to see that I did it and I didn't do it as well as that other person did. Um, but that's not, that's not the way of the Lord, you know? Mm. And even I found that in those moments where I've stepped out and I've made a mistake, the Lord has used it for his glory. Yeah. And the Lord has brought something, added something to my life through that. So then I look back and I'm like, gosh, I'm glad that I actually <laughs> made that mistake because I learned from it. I grew from it. Um, and I think the biggest, another big challenge is, is perfection. You know, we really don't have to be perfect. Yes. And it, it comes naturally, yes, but also it comes at taking that first step mm -hmm. and saying, I'm available. I can. I want to try. I want to try to serve in children's church. I want to, you know, I don't have the best voice, but I can hold a note can I come and sing in the youth meeting, you know? Small things like that. Can I stand at the door and greet people? I'm a bubbly personality. I love meeting new people. Can I do that? And then, you know, you'll find your place. But it's definitely not by sitting in the back row and yeah. hoping someone will come up to you and ask. Yes. So what I hear from both, both of you is this whole aspect of vulnerability, that at the end of the day, in spite of our personality traits, we are going to have to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about ambition, because ambition is a very interesting subject. Um, we all know that out there, that's what it's all about. We have to be ambitious. We have to be driven. Um, but for some people, it can be their Achilles heel or, you know, that shaky area that eventually brings their downfall. So yeah. is ambition a bad thing, Marco? Can I just, before we get to that question, yes. just build on what Sarah had said about finding your place Absolutely. in the church? I, again, I would really want to emphasize for young people just to be as simple in your faith as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible tells us that the callings of God, the giftings and callings of God will make room for itself. Mm -hmm. And we all, God has gifted us. It says unto each one a gift has been given. And he's gifted us in totally different ways. And the only way we will answer is when we're obedient to what the Lord puts before us and not to compare and to compete with others around us. Because... Some God has made administrative. Yes. Some God has made compassionate. Mm -hmm. Some God has made to be clear and to speak, you know. And we're all so different. And we just simply need to obey the Lord and be secure in what he's putting before us without comparing. And we'll be the best Christian that the Lord has called us to be. Okay. Yeah. And just what you said on ambition, you know, um, I was very challenged by this because I did feel like choosing to be a doctor was too ambitious. Um, and there was a time when it was about for a two-year period where I really had put that on the altar, put that aside, and said, Lord, if this is not what you have for me, then I'm willing to, to walk away. And 
that came through, I was in a youth meeting, and the Lord just asked me a question, will you love me even if you don't become a doctor? And I said, yes, Lord. And when the Lord asked a second time, I realized what he was asking. And I can tell you, I cried that night because it was as if a dream had been ripped out of my heart. But it was something that the Lord just wanted to put on hold for a time. And when it did come back, I was able to, I was very humbled through that entire process, I can tell you. Um, but it's great because now I can do it for the right reasons. Because now it's not about me. It's about what Jesus wants to do. And I do believe that, you know, there's some of us that are maybe more clever than others, more intelligent, and that in its way will open doors for certain things. Um, but ultimately, it's the motivation of our heart. What is our motivation for wanting to do that? Mm -hmm. And I think Marco can, can add and share a bit of his own testimony on that. Uh, okay. Oh, so, yeah, no, I think ambition is a very broad, depends what we want to be ambitious about. Uh, if we talk in Korea, uh, because I know that's very relevant to young people, I think the Bible's clear, if a man won't work here, he won't eat. Yes. And it's part of the way of life. But I think if we're going to do a job, it's not to become the best lawyer in town. It's not to become the best mechanic or the best engineer. But the Bible does tell us to do all things unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I think the Lord needs certain gifts and skills in his kingdom. One, to be a testimony in that environment uh, or that industry, but two, also that the giftings and the way he's made us and our careers can be a blessing to the Lord. Yes. That if I excel in whatever it is, whether it's in woodwork, but that can be a blessing to the Lord. If it's mm -hmm. plumbing, that could be a blessing to the Lord. And so I think there's no harm in being, doing the best you can mm -hmm. in that, in, in if you're studying. But if it's now ambition to be someone great, not even, you know, in, in a professional life, but even church life, uh, to be recognized, I think that's a very dangerous uh, ground to be on. And I think it all depends on the state of our heart. And so I hope that, ooh, sorry, I hope that answers yes, your absolutely. question. So essentially, it's not about ambition. It's not ambition that's terrible, but at the end of the day, it's the state of our hearts and the motivation, yeah. what is driving us to it. Yeah. And the vision at the end of the day is to stand before the Lord one day and, mm -hmm. and to be able to hear the words well done, my good and faithful servant. Yes. And that I did the best that I could in answering the call of God on each of our lives. Yes. Yeah. I think that really brings me to this subject of sonship. We've heard it say that, well, you should be a son or you should be a daughter in the house. Uh, what does this mean, Marco? Because what does it mean to be a son? I mean, I know I'm my mother's daughter. You're your mother's son. <laughs> Yeah. and so on and so on. What is it to be a son and to be a daughter? Yeah, <laughs> that's a deep question. <laughs> it's a deep one. Um, I think a lot of people, it's, this is not something that we can teach or understand intellectually in our minds what it is to be a son or a daughter in the house. Um, but I think in a natural setting, to be a son, you need a father. Okay? And the Lord has given the heart of the Father to his church through the apostolic ministry, through the apostolic message. And when we embrace that message for our lives and accept to be built on that foundation on, on, and to, to be ready to lose our lives and to deny ourselves and to pick up our cross and follow the Lord, we, we become a son in the gospel. And it's not something that we arrive to. It's not like, okay, I'm a son now and I've made it. Hey? Um, and it's not a title. You know, a title doesn't secure my sonship. You know, I can be a, a, a deacon in the church or whosoever in the church, mm -hmm. but even then, it doesn't make me a son. Yeah. Because how we respond to situations, how we respond to trials, how we respond to correction, how we respond to, to, to things around us, show us how much of a son we are or a daughter we are in the Lord. And uh, take, for example, you can be born into a family, but you're a baby at some stage, yes. then you become a child, and then you become a teenager, then you, and the more you grow in that, and the more you embrace the gospel, the more you become begotten uh, in, in the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, so just for a little clarity, you mentioned how you embrace it. So ideally, how is one to embrace it? Do you mind just elaborating yeah. or maybe? 
uh, yeah, it's, 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 okay. it's to live the reality of the message of the cross in our lives. Mm -hmm. That is the apostolic message that has come to us. And it's to accept, you know, uh, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, there are many teachers. You have many teachers, but very few fathers. And we shouldn't be so drawn, you know, we can be saved under an evangelical anointing or we can be drawn to a teacher's ministry and all these things are good. Mm -hmm. But we must recognize how the Lord brings a foundation to our lives through the apostolic message, through the apostolic message. And when we submit ourselves under that message and authority and allow our lives to be built on that, then we become a son, uh, more of a son. And my desire is to be more. I'll give you an example. I was thinking today when I was a teenager, maybe about 17, I was corrected by an elder, like properly corrected by. And you know, it took me two years to let go of that attitude. Mm. And you know, that just shows us how much are we a baby in the Lord? Or are we a son or are we a daughter? But the more we grow and the more we accept to forgive, to learn, to be, have a heart that is teachable, mm. we come out of this state of being a baby yes. and we're able to accept, you know, we accept correction, we accept even if it's in a carnal way, yes. but we can take things in the spirit. And that just shows us our maturity and it just shows how much of a son we are. Yeah. And so it's not about being a title yeah. because you can have hold an attitude, but be serving in the church and all that. But in reality, mm -hmm. the way you respond to situations shows your maturity and your sonship in the Lord. And I think it's a daily walk, you know. It's, it's easy. I can be a son today and then tomorrow I decide, no, I, I kind of want to deviate. I want to do something else. Yeah. Um, but remaining teachable is really vital because it's so easy to become proud and think, okay, now I've arrived. I've ticked all the boxes. I'm doing really well. But it's staying teachable and staying humble and staying open to correction um, from those that have walked the road before us because they are such gems. They really are. Um, but if we allow our attitude to get in the way and we hold on to things and we don't forgive, then we end up just being a stumbling block for ourselves. And even more dangerously, we can be for others. You know, I want to just highlight another character of a son. You know, <clears throat> a son is teachable and he's always willing to learn. If you look at Paul when he writes to Timothy, he says, Timothy, my son. Mm -hmm. And he says, imitate me. And he says, you know who you've learned these things from. And we must be careful where we learn things in our Christian walk. That we don't be like, when that apostolic direction or vision or whatever you want to call it comes, that we don't say, no, but I've got another opinion. You know, this is the way I see things. I don't impose it on anyone, but I see things my way. But how we allow the Lord to break us and to align us to that apostolic heart mm -hmm. is very important. And as a young person, we have many weird and wonderful things yes. on how things should work out, how things should be done. But I think when we have a heart to learn, mm -hmm. when I say not to question, but you understand what I'm saying, it's not to, to defy, but just to learn. And even if we don't understand things, to accept them. And in that way, the Lord is able to reveal himself to us. So my heart, uh, my heart is to stay in that place. Yes. And anyone who wants to grow in the Lord must have a teachable heart mm. and to know who he's learning and who he's opening his life to. Yes. So, yeah. Absolutely. I think the word that really comes to mind is having a supple heart, mm -hmm. one that is quite, you know, malleable, that can be molded and not just hard and stuck in its ways. Absolutely. All right, Sarah. Whilst you're still there, any advice for these young people, those that are right here with us, those that may be watching us right now? What would you say? How do we continue in this journey that we've started? Well, first of all, it's knowing Jesus loves you as you are with your weaknesses. Trust me, you might see us on here and think, gosh, those guys are great. Or maybe you don't. I don't know. But <laughs> either way, Amen. either way, you know, it's, it's so important to understand the love of the Lord for us. And don't waste your youth. These are the prime years of your life. And the decisions that you make now are going to affect the trajectory of your future. And I can tell you, there are people who I knew 10 years ago. We were in the same place sitting in those chairs where you're sitting. And now there's only a handful of them that are still serving the Lord. 
and that's just in a period of 10 years. In 20 years, I don't even know where they'll be. But what is my heart? My heart is I want to stay seated there. <laughs> I don't want to go astray. And, you know, it's a daily walk. It's, it's not going to be easy. But just take one step at a time. And Christianity, it's all about obedience. Just obey what the Lord is asking you to do today. And when you learn that quickly, to hear his voice, obey quickly, the next time he asks you to do something, it becomes easier. Because you've heard his voice, you've heard what he's told you, you've obeyed, you've seen him come through for you. And so now it's like, yes, Lord, of course I can do that. Doesn't mean we're always going to get it right. But it's so important because, you know, the times we're living in, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. It really isn't easy. And it's even harder for you than it was for me when I was your age. But it's not impossible because the Lord's grace is sufficient for us. And we need to cling to him, cling to those godly relationships. And hopefully we'll get there. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. And from you, Marco, any closing words? Yeah, it's been lovely to be with everyone tonight. And uh, it's taken me down memory lane when I was just starting my journey with the Lord. And one thing I just want to say to the young people is not to waste your youth. You know, I was chatting with Nyari earlier, and, and I was saying they don't send old men to war. But in any nation, when you go to war, you send young men. When you're 18, you're an adult, you can hold a gun. And it's because at that young age, there's a vigor, there's a strength, uh, there's an excitement sometimes that the Lord gives us. And he wants to harness that for his kingdom. And I want to tell you, you're only young once. And live it fully for the Lord. And maybe you think there's not great things you can do for the Lord, but I want to encourage all of us is to develop a heart of a servant in a young in your lives, you know, because the Lord wants to use you as you are, but there's so much you could do in the church, whether it's whatever it is. You know, I remember when I was 21, I was at college, and they were building a studio in the church that I was at, and, you know, I would go from class, straight from class to church, um, quickly do my homework, and I would work from 7 o'clock at night to 3 in the morning, get two hours sleep, sleep at the church, jump in the morning, shower, there were no showers in, at the church, wash myself, I don't know how I did, and straight to class, and for three, four days on end, and I, in my heart, I just wanted to serve the Lord. That's all I wanted, and it's in the little things that formed me, and that helped me in my service to the Lord today. So, no job is too small, no job is insignificant, if it's to open the, door, the, the doors for the church, if it's to close the windows, but let's develop in us a heart of a servant. And the Bible says to who is faithful with little will be given much. And let's be faithful in the little things, and you'll see how the Lord would add to your life and to your service for the Lord. Amen and amen. Uh, the scripture that comes to mind is that we ought to redeem the times, people, because the days are truly evil. And we've heard so much from Sarah and Marco tonight. And I'm sure for a lot of us, we are still trying to digest and process all that we've heard. But it's been really lovely having both of you here today. But before we actually wrap it all up, we would like to just bounce back to you all. Does anyone have a question? We've got some hands. Lovely. Um, this is a question that bothers me a little bit. If you give in to sin, if you do bad things, does it affect the blessings that you get or could get? I knew he'd pass me the mic on this one. So um, I think... I wouldn't say it affects the blessings you get because it doesn't affect God's love for us. Does, God doesn't love you any less if you fall. But sin always has consequences. And those consequences are not necessarily erasable. So it can mean that you fall, you make a mistake, and you come to the Lord and repent. But that doesn't mean that you're spared from consequences. If you look at the life of David, he fell many times. You know, and he did come back to the Lord, but there were also certain things he suffered as a result of the mistakes and the decisions he made. So I don't think the Lord spares us um, 
from that, but his heart for us is always that we can come back and that he can fully restore us. And it's also how, how much we want to be restored. You know, often we can say, oh, I have this weakness and I'm comfortable with my weakness. But really, when we want to surrender our lives, we're not going to be comfortable with it. It's going to bother us. And it might take years for the Lord to set you free from something. But some things are instant. There's things in my life that I've prayed for the Lord to set me free, and it's instant. But there's other things that's taken years. It's been a process. Um, but I hope that answers your question. Good evening. Uh, I've, I've learned that uh, God has given everyone a gift, a gift to prophesy and a gift to speak in tongues. How do you know that like, you, got, you have a gift and how do you know what gift it is? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's clear in God's word that he's given us his Holy Spirit. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for everyone. And at any age, you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and our heart is open, he's able to manifest himself in whatever way he wants to. And so there are different ways he does. There are nine uh, uh, gifts, of the, uh, uh, fruit, gifts of the Spirit. And it's not for us to decide how and when and, and who the Lord should use that for. But you know a gift, the Lord if he gives us a gift is to edify the body. So if he gives me a gift of prophecy, it's not for me just to prophesy and be a big, you know, and get all the attention, but it's to edify the person receiving the word. And so we mustn't be, and the Lord can use us in any way. Today it could be of prophecy, today it could be of healing, it could be a word of wisdom or discernment. But it's not for us to decide and to concentrate because the church has gone very left. Where someone prophesies, all he wants to do is prophesy. Sometimes, you know, it's of the flesh. And uh, it's led many people astray and it's made, made people think that they're certain, they're a prophet or whatever. But that's not the intention. Those gifts are to edify the body. And us, we just must be open to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and to the moving and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So I hope that answers your question. Oh, okay. So Marco had spoken about how it's dangerous to be in a place where you want to be recognized and acknowledged. So can you please expand on that? You, you know, the, 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 the Word of God tells us that even when the Son of Man came, He made Himself of no reputation. And whatever gifts or whatever talents the Lord has given us, whatever we do in the church, it's not to be recognized, it's not to compete, it's not to be better than someone else, but it's just to simply be obedient. And often, the Bible says, who much is given, much is required. And often when the Lord gives someone a gift of great measure, because everyone is, receives in different measures, He brings us through a narrow road, trials of life, to break us, to form us, to keep us humble. As Paul said, I received a thorn in my side. So it's not to be someone great in the church, but it's to be obedient to the Lord. Um, and also just to add on that, you know, there's a spirit that we can feel, and it's, it's not said. But when somebody has a certain gift, and they're using it for the Lord, and it's not to glorify themselves, it brings a sweet perfume you know, and it doesn't glorify them. It makes us look to the Lord, you know, and that's why somebody can come on stage and, and I can come on stage and I can sing a song and somebody else can sing the exact same song, but it brings something different because somewhere the Lord has gifted that person with a certain anointing or with a certain whatever it is, you know, I'm just giving worship as an example, um, but it's vast and it, it goes across, across all fields. So again, it comes down to what is the motivation of our heart? Amen. Okay. Uh, thank you. You spoke about careers and working hard. Obviously, medical school was very hard, and you had to make some decisions and stuff like that. How can these young people make a balance? Because sometimes uh, they can 
make an excuse of not working hard because they say, oh, I'm being ambitious. Where is the balance between studying hard for what God has given you to do and where is the balance, where is laziness in that? And even school-wise, what advice would you give to these young people concerning their studies? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, coming from the background of where we live in this country, times are hard, it's not easy. For many of you, and for my case, um, my parents, it was a lot of sacrifice to get me to get through school, to get through medical school. And, you know, my mom, she said she did a cartwheel the other day because she finally finished paying off my fees. And so um, I can tell you it wasn't easy. But I think the balance comes when we know our place. And um, there were times when I was going through exam week, which is very intense. Um, but I felt like I needed to go to this prayer meeting. And I can only tell you that it was the Holy Spirit that would lead and say, you need to be there. And I would go and I would be greatly encouraged. Um, but there were other times where people were like, oh, let's go, you know, let's, and I, I just was like, you know, right now I, I can't, I have to study for this. So it is a fine, a very, very fine line. Um, but I do think it's important to be diligent. And I think the Lord honors diligence and hard work. But again, it comes back to what is our motive? What is our motivation? Mm -hmm. It's true in my studies, I wanted to do well. I did, I'll be very honest with you. But why did I want to do well? So that I could treat my patients well, so that they could bring, that could bring glory to the Lord. You know, that was essentially the desire of my heart. And the Lord did honor that. But just a quick test to me, my first semester of medical school, I failed. And it was the first exam I'd ever failed in my entire life. So I was devastated. Mm -hmm devastated. And I remember going to the Lord and having so many questions and saying, okay, but I failed. Does this mean now that I shouldn't be a doctor? Does this mean, is this a sign that you're telling me that this is too much? But you know, the Lord has a sense of humor because that night there was a, a home cell and I went to that home cell. Didn't want to go, but I went. And um, when I was there, the pastor that night was speaking about failure. And I was like, okay, I get it. <laughs> That's for me. And I cried that entire meeting. And he kept yeah. looking at me and thinking, what is wrong with this girl? But it was so pertinent to me at that moment, you know. Mm -hmm. And I literally got home, re-signed up for the semester, pushed really hard, and ended up getting an overall A the next semester. But I still had to go back and write those exams. Yes. And I was the only one who had to rewrite those exams. And it was very humbling. But by the Lord's grace, I made it through and, and I continued. So often there are going to be trials and tests mm -hmm. along the way. And I do believe the Lord can use our career path, our schooling to show us what he wants for us. But also we discover God's plan through those things. You know, it's not always we think, okay, I'm going to get that revelation while I'm sitting in a meeting. Sometimes it, when I was in a lecture and I'd be like, okay, Lord, this is what you're asking me to do. Okay. So it comes in different shapes and sizes, but I believe that obedience is key. All right, we'll take one more question. <laughs> um, hi. Um, Marco, you talked about sonship and serving in the church and all of that. So what if you want to serve the Lord, you're genuinely there, and then a job does come for you, but it's like you don't like it, not because your heart is bad or you're lazy or anything, but it's because, like, for example, let's say you have ADHD, and then it's an office job. So you can't exactly do it. So does that make you, like, a horrible person? Does that make you lazy? Like, how does that work? Because are you like, Lord, technically you gave it to me, but I don't want to do this. So how do you go about that? Thank you. Yeah, if you have no choice and you're there, you must just do what you need to do. And you go through it. If you, if you struggle concentrating, then you find another means. Uh, to do the job, but to do it faithfully and to do it well. Um, but definitely if we, someone is in paying us to do a job and we do it half-heartedly, it's as though we're shortchanging and we're cheating that person out of the wage they're giving us. Mm. And I, I don't believe that's honorable to the Lord. So even if it's a struggle, even if it's a work against our character, we must do all things faithfully as unto the Lord regardless of the circumstance. So I think that's it for questions. Um, 
I just wanted to say, when we were young in the, in the youth group, we were teenagers and uh, the different brothers used to come and take the meetings. There was a long queue. There were no cell phones and social media, so you couldn't just contact anyone during the week. But we used to queue up behind the different brothers, and they took time until late at night sitting with us, one after the other. And they are faithful men, like we heard from our brother Mark Labonte last week. Faithful men that want to take care of you. And when we make ourselves vulnerable and we open up our lives to them, there's so much treasure and riches they can deposit in our lives. So although we couldn't answer all the questions, you're welcome to answer, to ask questions to all the different elders, the different brothers that are there, and to be able to learn and to glean from what the Lord has taken them through. So that's all for tonight. Nyari, thank you for having us, and thank you everybody for your attention. So I'll hand over to you, Nyari. Once again, Marco, Sarah, thank you so much for being a part of this. And to you guys, thank you so much for joining us. And that officially brings us to the end of our talk show. Amen. So I think we can give them a bigger round of applause. So we thank you, Marco and Sarah. Um, I think that was really special. Hey, I think we can all say, we can all see how faithful the Lord has been in their lives. You know, Marco was talking about the persecution that he faced at school. Um, I went to school with Marco. And uh, I was one of those people that were persecuting him, you know? And I was one of those people that were trying to test, is there really a God? Hey, there was, he was one boy in 600 who was standing up and talking about Jesus. And for me, the way he stood out there, the way he got secluded, changed my life. And it marked my life, you know? And till the time that I actually got born again, I always remembered this same guy that stood for Christ, and he spoke about Jesus when we were in school. You know? How precious that is, eh? That the stand that we can make, the stand that we make in school, wherever, no matter how insignificant we think it is, but it will change someone else's life. Eh? So, young people, I think today was so precious for us, eh? Very, very special meeting. And we can't take it for granted. You know, we're hearing it for a reason. The Lord wants to do something in our lives. If he can do it for them, he can do it for us. Hey, he's the same God. He wants to see us well. And he has a plan for each one. And we heard so many things. We heard how each of us are part of the body. Hey? Gifted specially. And the Lord wants to use each one. Each one of us was created in his image. So do not despise what he has given you. But let us press on. Let us look to the Lord. Um, there is a scripture that Nyari talked about. Um, it's in Ephesians 5, verse 14. Uh, it reads, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Amen. We need to understand what the will of the Lord is for our lives. We need to take our place in the church. We need to trust the Lord for what he has put before us. We need to be faithful with what he has given us. So that we may hear those words, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. Amen? Amen. So I think we can pray, we can trust the Lord, that as we go home, you know, we reflect on what, he has, what we heard tonight. Let's not let it come in one ear, go out the other, and we crack on with our lives. But we are blessed to be hearing such. Amen. Amen. So we can pray and we trust the Lord that he will help us. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for such a special time that we had. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that clearly it has come to us, Father God, your love for each one of us, Lord. And Father, how we want to trust you to trust you, Father God, for this gift of salvation in our lives, Lord. How, Lord, we want to serve you with all that we have. Lord, we want to trust you with everyone that is here, Lord. We're trusting that, Father, their eyes may be opened in the spirit 
to see your plan and your purpose for their lives. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for this time. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that this seed that has been planted will take root in our lives and we can be effective. We can be the light to this dark and perverse generation. We thank you, Lord. We commit our lives into your hands in your precious and mighty name. Amen. 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 So thank you all. Good night.